Today I want to talk to you about something called the Strobel effect. Now, maybe you know who Lee Strobel is, maybe you don't. Um, I really enjoy his books. I think he has a lot of great stuff to say. I don't agree with him on everything, but I hardly ever agree with any, anybody on everything. So sometimes I don't even agree with myself. It'll be like a couple years later, and I'll see like a Facebook memory, and I'll be like, ah, I don't really agree with that anymore. So um, Lee Strobel became, excuse me, became popular by writing a book called The Case for Christ. And since then, he's written a series of other books, The Case for a Creator, The Case for Miracles, among others. And one of the things that I've noticed is where Christians use apologetics, which is the study, um, basically the, the, the study for answers, why you believe what you believe as a Christian. Eh, that's a good enough example, uh, or definition, I mean. And they use the study of apologetics to try and become argumentative and to try and, you know, get into fights and to try and, you know, be as loud and obnoxious as possible. And this is something I call the Strobel effect. It's where you read a book, a Christian book on apologetics that helps you to understand something that you never understood before. And in your new zeal, in your, you know, encouraged faith, you take that as an opportunity to attack other people. And it might sound like, oh, I don't do that. But let's keep in mind a few of the things that the Bible talks about. The Bible talks about how we should be living quiet lives, how, you know, we shouldn't be going around in fruitless discussions, um, how we should how we should watch our mouths, um, how, you know, a fool opens his mouth, but a wise person stops and thinks, how it says to be slow to anger, slow to speak, quick to listen. Things like this, and we take all those different things about, you know, guarding our mouths and, and staying quiet and, and being respectable and all these different things and showing people love, and we use it as a, well, yeah, but, and we kind of add our own little thing that we, we already know that it's wrong, and we realize that we're saying something stupid and we're shooting off our trap all the time, but we kind of camouflage it. One of the ways that we do that is we say, well, the prophets, and we have in our head that, these, that the prophets were like these loud, in-your-face people that like went to the Walmart parking lot and just tried to irritate people and tell them they were going to hell. But it's not really the image that we see from the Bible. We see uh, the prophets as people who were oftentimes grieving for the sake of the people who they were talking to. Predominantly, they were talking to people who knew better and just didn't. And, you know, the, there's a lot of other things to it, um, which we don't have time to talk about today. But all this comes down to we have an attitude problem. And we kind of have a little bit of rebellious streak in us. And we kind of have a prideful arrogance to us that we're smarter than other people. We have it all figured out and they don't. And so all that comes together. And rather than dealing with our problems, we try and make it where, oh, the world today, they just don't want to hear truth. So then when we when we hear something like or read something in a book, like a least trouble book, we get so encouraged and just adds fuel to the fire. And we go and we open our mouths and we kill witnessing opportunities because we're so busy trying to show that we have the answers, we know everything. So if I have all the answers and I say everything perfect, I can change them. No, you can't. Even if you have the right, all the right answers, even if you say everything perfect, you still can't make somebody else's choice for them. You can't force somebody to believe and you having all the perfect answers and the perfect attitude and the perfect isn't going to make somebody else's decision for them. If it did, Everybody would repent and come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ because God is perfect. Yes? So therefore, if God is perfect, according to your reasoning, everybody should repent, but not everybody does repent. So with that being said, if people aren't going to listen to God, how much more so are they not going to listen to you? If God allows people to ha make, the, make a decision about whether or not to follow him, you have to do the same, and you have to say, okay, I can't make this person's decision. I'm not going to try and cram Jesus down their throat to where it kills my opportunity to really impact their life and show them Jesus. Sometimes we get such in a, in a hurry for somebody to make a decision for Christ, they would actually fail to show them Christ. Christ is shown in the suffering, in the unfairness, in the weakness, in the frailty of life and of your situation. And when we try to shortchange that, we just kind of make it where it seems like we're being impatient and pushy, not actually showing the love of Christ. 
you know, well, you gotta, you gotta tell it to them straight. I'm not saying you should sugarcoat, sugarcoat the gospel or water down the message. I'm just saying there's better ways to talk to people than to go up to them and say, I'm right, you're wrong, you have to agree with me. There's better ways to deal with things. I mean, and I, I know, I know I have a problem when somebody walks up to me in, in, in Barnes and Noble, for instance, and says about how I should do this and how I should do that. And it's like, do I know you? <laughs> How much more so about such a hot topic as religion? I mean, imagine this. You are minding your own business at a coffee shop, for instance, and you're, I mean, you're gonna go, you're gonna go get a cup of coffee. Why not? And somebody walks up and they say, you should vote for whoever the person is you don't like. And would your thought be, well, that's really none of your business and I have no idea who you are? Probably. You'd probably start arguing with them and maybe try to talk about how your candidate's better. More often than not, we use this studying the uh, studying apologetics, uh, apologetics and getting answers. We just use it as an excuse for Christians to treat non-believers rudely. More often than not. Now it's okay to engage in, in questions and, and I mean in conversation. And if people have questions, to really answer those questions and to talk with them. Or if you don't know, to say, hey, I don't know, and you know, try and look it up and, and to enter into that dialogue. That's certainly normal and healthy. People. Talking is normal, but there's a difference between trying to build a relationship and trying to be right. And it's not okay to get into these frequent unbiblical arguments and fights. And I think a good check is this. Are people getting saved or do they always go away the same way? They just didn't want to hear the truth. When everybody doesn't want to hear the truth, maybe it's the way that you're relaying the, the truth. Maybe you're being foolish with how you're presenting the gospel. Maybe you need to gain wisdom. Some people, some people in and out of the church, I'm not just saying Christians, just people in general, just want to argue and be quarrelsome. There is many times when people would comment on a video of mine uh, asking a question and I would answer and so they just have more and more questions and keep deflecting until they felt like there was a question that I didn't know which normally didn't happen because they typically bring up the same like four or five things over and over again not because I know everything just because they bring up the same things over and over again and um, most of the time I found that they were just there to argue they didn't want to learn they didn't want to know and it just kind of wasted time So I guess my admonition here would be have wisdom and grow in character. Have wisdom, know when to say and when not to say, and then grow in character. Don't be argumentative. Don't try to win arguments. Try to win people. And there's a difference between a healthy conversation and respect with mutual interaction and talking versus talking down to someone. And I think sometimes part of this is how what you're saying and how you're saying it, but I think another part is how they are interpreting it. You have to be aware of what your facial expression is, what your body language is, what your tone of voice is, what the words are. And really stop and listen to yourself and say, if I was that person, would I think that I was being purposely offensive? Because I think sometimes we say, oh, well, people are just so afraid of, of not being offensive that they're, they're not telling people the truth anymore. I'm not talking about... You know, the gospel is already offensive, but you don't have to add to it by your attitude. That's, I guess, a good way of saying it. So maybe your attitude stinketh. Maybe you should ask other people who aren't like you. Do I seem a little bit in your face? Do I seem kind of rude, maybe? Because I don't see Jesus telling us to be rude at all. So a good example of this is what happens on social media. And, you know, on social media, people go looking for fights on both sides, right? Not just Christians, not just non-Christians, both. They'll go on a YouTube video, for instance, and they'll just start spewing forth their nonsense looking for a fight. You know, or, or looking to see somebody who's already in a fight and joining in. Yeah, because that's that's smart. That's that's real smart. The Bible warns us to protect, to put a guard over our mouth. It, it, it's important also that we protect our heart from getting burned out. If we waste all of our time and energy having these fruitless discussions, eventually we're not going to have enough energy to do actual like 
volunteering at a church or ministry work or anything like that because we're going to be so busy and consumed with this kind of stuff. And then we're going to start thinking that everybody out there is like that. No, no, that's like the drug addict who dates drug addicts and says, this. why are guys or girls always like this? And it's like, well, maybe it's the people that you're dating. And it's the same kind of an idea or the people that you're hanging around with. And it's the same kind of idea that happens here. Just because you frequently, went into, frequently run into people in YouTube comments doesn't mean that that's all the people that there are in the world. So keep things in perspective here. Um, and remember in all these things to be very quick to hear but slow to speak. Save yourself a lot of time. Sometimes we go and we just instantly profile somebody and we say, oh, oh, they're like this. They don't. They just don't want to hear the truth or whatever. And so then we've already decided what they're like and we miss the bigger picture and we don't really learn and we don't really connect with them because they're nothing but a box to us. Something that we've already weighed the value of. And we see them as either po positive or negative. Oh, this person's just a negative. You know, see what I mean? They're just too stupid. So, I hope that this was helpful. Um, be aware of the Strobel effect. Um, nothing wrong with Lee Strobel, nothing wrong with his books. Beware of what you do with the knowledge.